Hi everyone, this is video 4A of the Regents Chemistry Curriculum. Uh, by the end of this video, you should be able to uh, change substances physically and draw particle diagrams to model them. And also you'll be able to use information about the boiling point of different uh, substances to compare the strength of their intermolecular forces. So if uh, we'll talk about that in a second. And uh, here are some questions. Determine whether the following statements are true or false. If you don't know the answers to these questions, don't worry. You should be able to know the answers by the end of this video. Pause the video, read them, and uh, try to answer them. All right, let's get started. Physical change. Okay, so it's a reversible process. Phase change is an example. If I change a substance from uh, the solid phase to the liquid phase to the gaseous phase, I'm only changing the appearance of the substance, but I'm not changing the substance itself. So I'm not, so for example, if I have ice water and I melt the ice water, it's not like I'm gonna have copper. I'm still gonna have water, it's only gonna be melted water. And if I evaporate the water, I'm still gonna have water, it's just only gonna be water in a steam phase or in a, in a gas phase. So uh, changing the appearance of an object does not change the object into something else. It only just changes the way it looks. So that's a physical change. Okay. If I crush a piece of copper, here are some keywords. If I crush a piece of copper, I'm still going to have copper. Doesn't matter how much I crush it. If I take some salt and dissolve it in water, I'm still going to have the salt. It's just going to be dissolved in water and so on. Conductivity, whether something conducts electricity, is an example of a, a physical property. Uh, the density of something is an example of its physical property. Again, we talked about this earlier in previous videos, but the density is simply an, is, an, is, is, is considered an identifier of an element. So uh, if, if something has a specific density, uh, we can actually determine uh, whether, by looking at table S, we can determine whether that uh, object that we have is made of uh, pure metal or not. So for example, uh, we, I believe we talked before about gold and uh, gold, if we look at table S, we see that gold has a, gold is number 79 if I remember correctly. Yes. So gold has a density of 19.3. If you want to know whether your gold chain or gold necklace is uh, made 100% of gold, you'll, you'll it'll have a density, you can measure its density, density equals to mass divided by volume. And uh, that if it equals to 19.3, then you know you have a real 100% pure gold chain. There's actually another way to measure density, and that is through the water displacement method. So uh, you will place a certain amount of water in a container, okay? Maybe you can put 10 milliliters of water in a container. You can have a scale here. You can put your necklace on a scale to see uh, how much it uh, weighs. So you measure the mass of the necklace in grams. Then you take your necklace and you put it inside that 10 milliliters of water. Obviously, when you drop something in water, the level of the water rises. So maybe you want to use a graduated cylinder because it shows you exactly how much the water rose. So if you had your 10 milliliters and now the water went up to 12 milliliters after you dropped your necklace chain in it, now you can calculate the density of your neck ne uh, of your necklace actually you take your grams density equals to mass over volume so you'll take your grams that you just measured and you divide it by the 
difference in the volume. So if you, you ended with 12 milliliters after you dropped the necklace and you started with 10 milliliters, 12 minus 10 gives you a volume of 2 milliliters. So the amount of grams that you have divided by the amount of milliliters that were displaced when you dropped the necklace will give you your density. Okay, so that's the water displacement method which you can use to measure the density of irregular objects. If you had uh, a textbook, for example, then the volume uh, can be calculated using length times width times height. You don't have to use the water displacement for a textbook. Uh, obviously, you will not get accurate results if you try to put a deck textbook in a container and see how much the uh, volume changes by. So length times width times height is another way to calculate the volume and uh, you can use the scale to calculate the mass and then mass divided by volume will give you the density. Okay. Another thing I should probably note, one centimeter cubed is equivalent to one milliliter. So when you're doing this, you're going to get your answer in centimeter cubed. Okay, let's go back to physical change. Here are some particle diagrams. Solids will have crystalline structures. Liquids, the particles are slightly spaced out, a little far away from each other, but not too far. And gas, the particles are really randomly arranged and they will uniformly fill any size, any size container. As you can see, particles here in a gas are very, uh, randomly arranged inside the container and they uh, will fully fill out the container. They're not just settling at the bottom like the liquid or the solid. They are all over the place. So gases have what we call very high entropy and entropy means the random arrangement of particles. So gases have a high random arrangement of particles. If you increase the heat on a solid, you will eventually increase the entropy of the solid gas particles. The gas particles will begin to move faster and eventually will di divide away and become liquid. And then eventually they'll even have higher entropy and divide away and become gas. So with high enthalpy, in other words, with higher temperatures, we get higher entropy. Systems in nature, like plants, they are a system in nature. Uh, humans are systems in nature they tend to favor higher entropy and lower energy. So plants tend to lose their energy eventually, because eventually everything, every living thing dies. And uh, they tend to get messy. If you don't take care of your plants, eventually your plants will go a little wild. They'll get really wild. Okay. Let's go on. You can read this. Very important that we know that sublimation is only happens to substances that have very weak intermolecular forces, such as dry ice. Deposition is actually changing gas to solid directly and that happens when whenever it snows disregard this okay we previously talked about in the first video we talked about the different types of elements uh, monatomic which are pretty much most of the elements on the periodic table this is how you draw monatomic elements just a single circle to uh, represent the particle diagram of a monatomic element. Then you have diatomic elements. Diatomic elements, remember the Brinkelhoff word. Uh, we use identical circles bonded together to represent diatomic elements. They have to be identical, same color, and they have to be in pairs. Binary compounds. Uh, here's an example, NaCl. One atom represents Na, maybe red. 
One atom represents chlorine, maybe white. NaCl is a binary compound. There are only two atoms in here, hence why there are only two circles in here. Two circles, two atoms. One atom is different from the other, hence why there is one red and one white. It is a compound, which means the atoms are bonded together, hence why we, the, these two circles are stuck together. All compounds have fixed proportions, which means that every other uh, circles you're going to draw have to be exactly the same, fixed proportions. They're always going to have a one to one, one red to one white, one red to one white for the Na to represent NaCl. If you had, for example, MgCl2, this is also a binary compound, but now you're going to have one red circle to represent maybe Mg, but now you have two atoms of chlorine, so maybe one white circle to represent the first chlorine, and another white circle to represent the second chlorine. So this is how you draw MgCl2. On the other hand, if you have a ternary compound, meaning a compound that's made of more than two elements, example hydrogen cyanide, then you would have three different atoms in this case, three different colors, green, uh, green, red, and white. There's one atom of each, hence why there's one circle of each. If you have a mixture uh, of, uh, let's say, a binary compound, here's a binary compound, maybe NaCl, diatomic and monatomic elements, here's a diatomic element, here are monatomic elements. Notice this has varying proportions. I may have more of the, uh, the monatomic elements than I do of the diatomic elements or the uh, binary compound. Okay, so this is how we draw particle diagrams. Make sure you practice that. Next, table H. So table H presents the relationship between vapor pressure and temperature. Let's read this. Let's take a look at table H to interpret that. Here we are. So this is the dotted line they're talking about. And the boiling point, it's the point at which the curve intersects with that dotted line. So this dotted line is the standard pressure, 101.3 kilopascal, and the second you exceed that standard pressure, you begin to boil. Notice that propanone is boiling at 50 degrees Celsius, actually 55 degrees Celsius, while water does not boil until it gets to 100 degrees Celsius. What does that mean? We need a lot more energy to change water from liquid phase to gaseous phase. And that is because water has stronger intermolecular forces. And we'll talk more about hydrogen bonds. Water has a very strong hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond is present anytime hydrogen bonds with fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. So hydrogen having fun makes a very strong bond. Propanone is a much weaker substance, okay? Ethanol is a much weaker substance. Ethanol is actually the alcohol that's present in licorice drinks. That is, uh, it boils at 80 degrees Celsius, so it changes to gas at 80 degrees Celsius. All right, so lower boiling point means weaker intermolecular forces. Higher boiling point means stronger intermolecular forces. So that's really all we need to know about table H. Here's more information for you to read. Here I talk about the electronegativity difference between H and F in the compound HF is higher than between H and I in the compound HI. Therefore, HI has stronger intermolecular forces and higher boiling point. So we talked about H1. Let's discuss it a little more. Uh, if you're comparing HF, the bond between HF versus the bond between HN, you can determine which one is which bond is stronger. Therefore, which bond has a higher boiling point 
by simply just calculating the electronegativity difference between these two atoms. So the attra the ability the attract electronegativity is the attraction for electrons. So if there's a higher difference in their will to attract electrons, we have what we call a very, very strong bond. So let's take a look at table S. It has all the electronegativity values. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.2. Take a look at fluorine. It has an electronegativity of 4.0. And nitrogen has an electronegativity of 3.0. So going back to our initial question, which one of those is, has a stronger bond? Which one of those will boil at a higher temperature? So hydrogen is 2.2. Fluorine is... 4.0 find the difference between these two hydrogen here is 2.2 nitrogen here is 3.0 find the difference between these two so here we have a difference of 0.8 an electronegativity difference of 0.8 while we have here an electronegativity difference of 1.8 so obviously here a higher electronegativity difference for HF, this means that HF has a stronger intermolecular force between those two atoms, hence why HF would have a higher boiling point than HN. So HF has stronger intermolecular forces and a higher boiling point. It boils at 67 degrees Fahrenheit, while HI here uh, is boiling at 31 degrees. If you were talking about HN, obviously you'll have a, a lower boiling point than HF as well. So that's pretty much our lesson uh, for today. Uh, let's go back to the questions. Read the following statements and determine whether they're true or false. All right, thank you.